All right. Hey, it is Easter. Welcome to Streamline Church, and it is Resurrection Sunday. We are so happy that you would join us today and that you would let us in your living room. We're going to have a great time this morning. Here's some things I want you to do. Number one is if you would on social media, you would share our service with as many people so we can fill up the house, the church. And then also if you could just comment and share some great things that are happening in the service and uh, share that with other people, that'd be fantastic. And then the other thing is that you would turn up the volume in your house, you would get your praise on, and we can celebrate the work of Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you, Jesus, for laying down your life just for us. And so, Father, I pray that you would be blessed by our time of worship and how we glorify you and how we lift up the name of Jesus today. Lord, we thank you that you are not dead. You are alive. In Jesus' name, someone say amen. Get our hands going where we are. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? His love is mighty, so much stronger. Who shakes a whole earth? Holy God, who leaves his breath? Who leaves his breath? In all in wonder, in all in wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Come on, we sing it out while you stand. This is amazing grace. Because of you, hey. Oh, oh, oh. Jesus, 
We say it out all over the room. We say. Once apart from time, there was a dad and there was a son. Enjoying quality existence, the dad said to the son, I have an idea. Let's work together equally and invent something that has not yet come to be. Let's do it, dad. What do you need from me? Just the usual unity, what I had in mind was, why don't we create a being that will reflect the beauty and strength of we? So they develop the structure, wrap up the blueprints. Now let's make it happen. They say we'll keep it pretty basic and use some of this dirt we piled up here we've been saving. They finished man, and man would have been finished. But he shared life so we could be refinished. I mean, people make fun of the team that's on a losing streak. Well, that was us. We were that team. I know what it's like to look in the mirror ashamed of the man I am. I was too close to worldly things. That makes your vision blurry. But to be too close to Christ can only make you see clearly. From reading books, I struggle just getting past the foreword. But he's the after, the before word. Proved his love in four words. I died for you. Saved from sins. Now our sins can meet earth as we meet him. Because he parted the seas of sin. Now we sing, how great thou part. We've had our share of insults, but if there were a hashtag for his blood, your face would show in the search results. He has won it all for me. Now my cry is, you have won it all. So form me to your image. I questioned redemption. He showed off his superpowers. He was like Mark Possible. Now he's like Kim Possible and James Possible. But me not love you, impossible. He made ends meet. Our end met his end, but his end was equal to everlasting life, being born again to cover sin. We would shed blood over and over again. So only the perfect man could win the Hall of Fame over sin. His face hit the dirt and probably reminded him of when he made you. Now the gospel has gone viral with trillions of views. You are his world view, so your YouTube channel needs just one view from he who viewed you from every avenue. He's the groom that died for a bride that was iffy with her commitment. So if she chose to leave him, it wouldn't be because his love wasn't legit. Perhaps he could have set up a comfortable instant death and just sent us all a text saying, I died for you. Instead, he lived a real, rugged, raw life. Marked history, showed he lived and died for you. Dad created you and found joy, so he sent his one boy. This is real life, no toy story. He's given us a new name, but his is unchanged. I like to call him Rose from the grave.
is the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Our judge, our defender, our judge and our defender. Suffered and crucified, forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light, forever seated high. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Oh, and I believe in you. Say it again. We say, I believe in you. I believe in you, Lord. Oh, and I believe in you. I believe in you, Lord. And I believe you rose again. I believe, oh, I believe that Jesus Christ. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I Father, we thank you. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for the price that you paid that we could never repay. Lord, I thank you that because you died on a cross, my sins are forgiven. Lord, and I thank you for what you have done for what you are doing and for what you are about to do. Lord, I give you all the honor. We give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Let's give him a hand of praise right where you are at. We say, welcome to the
Hey, again, guys, we're so glad that you have joined us for our Easter service and a time of worship and the experience that we're having together. And uh, I'm thankful that you're here. And I just, before we move forward, continue to move forward in the service today, I just, you know, I just want to pray for the needs that we have and sicknesses and, and fears, our economy, and all these different things that can just cause tension and anxiety to rise. And I just want to pray right now. And uh, I don't want to skip these moments. And so maybe if you can uh, go ahead and bow your heads and close your eyes for a minute. And I want you to know this, and we've already been experiencing it in our worship time, is that the Spirit of the Lord is here. And He's here, and all we have to do is pray and call out to Him, and He responds. So let's do that right now. Heavenly Father, we come to you today. Lord, how much that we need your healing. Lord, how much we need your direction, your wisdom. Father, I pray for the economy, and those who have lost jobs. Lord, those who are trying to get the unemployment and, and Father, just trying to make ends meet. Those, Lord, who uh, may be just the living circumstances, Lord, are really difficult right now. Lord, would you provide for them, Lord? Would you, would you help usher us through this time? Lord, for those who are sick and the, the virus that's continuing to spread, Lord, we just ask in the tender, loving way that you do, Lord, that you would put a stop to it in the name of Jesus. You calmed waves, so Father, would you just calm the sickness, Lord? And so Father, we just speak life, we speak healing, Lord, and we speak your hand to move over everybody that is sick, Lord. And so we declare, Lord, life today. And God, I pray that, Lord, as we're just watching and going through this time of the service today and, and into the message, that, Lord, your word, Lord, would bring power Lord, it would bring confidence and it would bring courage in you. So, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for being the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to go ahead and prepare you for the offering today. We're going to take that. We still like to do all that we can to create this as part of our, uh, our service, our worship experience. And so if you would go ahead and prepare that, maybe you want to just go ahead and pull out your phone and go to our app, or you can go to our website. And uh, there's three ways to give here. You can see you can give online on our website or on our app. You can open that up. And then some have been sending their tithe in the mail. And I want you to know you going out of your way and inconveniencing yourself to support the church is huge. And so I'm so thankful for that. And uh, we're just going to pray in a minute. But before we do that and receive the offering, there are some important things uh, that we have going on to help us stay connected. One of the most difficult things and, and uh, the trying things for me in my heart right now is for us to get disconnected and kind of pull apart. And so here at Streamline, we're to, trying to do everything we can to keep us together as a body, to keep us together as, as friends and as a uh, church family to move through this time. And so make sure you pay attention to these important announcements this morning. Good morning. I'm so glad we got to spend or we get to spend some time together today and happy Easter. So if you have never been to our church, um, we want to honor that. And so we have an opportunity for you to win a gift card. And so if you hang with us throughout the service, we'll announce the details of that at the end of the service. So look for that. Um, and then also, We've been doing a series of Zoom meetings for our interactive Bible studies just so that we can stay connected. And so what we're doing is we're starting a series of Z groups. Um, and as you'll see on the screen, we have a, a number of Z groups. Finding Peace, uh, which is sort of a counseling group. We've got a mom's group, a Bible study on Wednesday, a men's group on Thursday, and a ladies group on Saturday. So lots of ways to get connected, stay connected, grow spiritually. We'd love to see you there. Um, and so hopefully you've been preparing for your offering. So we're going to go ahead and pray for that now. Lord, we just thank you, God, for your comfort and your provision, God, in this time. Uh, things are a little rocky, I'm sure, Lord, for some of us. And so we just ask, God, that you would cover them in your peace. And God, we thank you for allowing us to be stewards, Lord, of our finances, God. And so we just ask, God, that you would 
Give us the discernment, Lord. Give us the, the Holy Spirit speaking to us, God, in the ways that we should be giving, Father. We just ask that you bless the offerings that come in. We thank you, Lord, that we have the opportunity to give. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. was crowned in gold is crowned in glory now Savior now to wash our feet now and It's Easter, and I'm so excited to share with you uh, the, from the Word of God, and I tell you what, this is my goal today, is I want you to be comf uh, comforted, I want you to feel confident in who God is, and I just want you to have hope today, and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start this new series called a Holy Chaos. Everyone say, Holy Chaos. Now, come on, you can do better than that. Say, Holy Chaos. Yeah, we're going to learn about how, how to learn to, to see God amid life's mess. What I'm trying to do is help you feel better about going through problems in your life. And uh, so we're going to talk about how there can be something good happening from God in the midst of chaos. Now, the, uh, where this series came from and how it was birthed was really in, in me back in uh, December, January. And there were some just some personal things that I was going through in my heart and in just things that I was dealing with, and it was, it was in my mind and in my heart, it was chaotic. And here I was trying to just figure out, it just seemed like when, when I had one thing, there was another thing that dropped. And when I went, what, did one thing, all of a sudden there was a mistake over here. And it just seemed like things weren't working together. And then as I began to get out of that season though, and out of that time period, I'm able to look back and I've just seen how God just allowed some things to fall together and into place. And that's where this really um, stirred my heart coming into Easter was 
you know what? There can be something great that happens in the midst of chaos when we don't even see it. And that's what holy chaos is. We're going to try to learn over the next several weeks how to see God amid the chaos and the, the mess that we go through in life. And I didn't know, and I don't know if you would call it prophetic or not, um, I didn't know how much, how, how real and how relevant it would be for us right now in this time with the illness and sickness going on in 2020. So I know this is a timely word for you and for me in every area of our lives. And so here's how chaos is defined. It's utter confusion and disorder. Everyone say utter. Utter confusion and disorder. This is something that happens where everything's just out of control. We don't understand it. Things that used to be a certain way, now they're not. And it just seems like everything's shuffled and, and it, we, we can't figure up from down. Back when I was younger, there was, I remember we were out with some friends and we were out at the ocean and we were just jumping waves and that day the tide was so strong, uh, I remember we were, just, we were just having so much fun laughing because it was just throwing us around like crazy and we would jump in the water and these waves would crash and I remember my body was just like tossed all over the place and my legs would be flapping, my head uh, would hit the ground sometimes and I'd get a scratch my back would hit hard, and it was just slamming and throwing around, and, and I couldn't tell up from down. And, you know, sometimes that's what life looks like. It looks like chaotic. It's chaos. We're, it's like we're getting kicked in the head. I mean, it's, it's tough to go through these times. And, you know, when we're going through these times and life is looking like this, it's, it's kind of like we just sit back and we're like, hey, wait a minute. What's going on? Why is this happening to me? If you're experiencing that right now, I'm sure that thought, that question is coming to your mind. Why is this happening to me? See, that's what holy chaos does is it helps us to see outside of ourselves and we learn how to look for God. And so holy chaos is really where I'm searching to find God's touch, God's presence in the midst of my problems. That his holiness, his divinity, and who he is, he makes the chaos right, and he's doing something even though I can't see it. And so the questions that rise up when I'm like, man, where's God? God, why aren't you doing anything? Why are you allowing this? It gives me a little bit more comfort and hope in the fact that, this, that God may be in that moment, but they're never easy. You know, I called this uh, message today train wreck. And the, the reason I call it train wreck is I, I just, as we're going to look at uh, the buildup of Jesus going to the cross and dying on the cross, it just, if you add all the different pieces together and you look at it from different points of view, I mean, it was a train wreck. It was just a mean collision. Now, here's the thing when I hear the word train wreck, the first thing I think of is sushi. I think of sushi, and I'm going to tell you why. It's because at my favorite sushi restaurant, Makuni's, uh, the, the best uh, sushi roll they have is a train wreck. And as a matter of fact, I got one here that, uh, that I want to show you. Even though you can't really see it, I'm going to pretend you can see it. And then I'm, I'm going to go ahead and get one because these things are so stinking awesome. And so I'm going to go ahead and... Um, Mm. This is so good. It's got different spices and different types of fish and um, so many different th things to it. It is so delicious and good. Now, here's the thing. It's called the train wreck because it's like everything but the kitchen sink is thrown into the train wreck. And it's a mess, but it tastes good. And I want us to see something. I want us to see this whole crucifixion through the lens of like the sushi and, and, and how, it's, how, it's, how there's so much to it, but it's so good, is that what happened with Jesus, it was a train wreck. And when you've ever looked at a picture of a train wreck, it is a disaster and it's, it's hard to look at, but at the same time, you're intrigued. And there's something about this crucifixion of Jesus Christ and how brutal and how torturous it was, and how, te I mean, it was, it was terrible what he had to go through. But there's something inside of us that is intrigued, that, man, I got to see why this happened. 
There's something about this love that still draws us. And instead of this being something that we run from or saying it's terrible, even though it is, is that we're looking at it and we're saying, this is a beautiful collision. This is a beautiful collision of this love that God has and he's willing to go through this pain and he's willing to do it all for me. Jesus was willing to go through a train wreck for you and for me. And that's why I love him. That's why I serve him. That's why I give my heart to him. And if you haven't done that yet, I promise you, the best thing you could ever do is say yes to Jesus because he went through a train wreck for you. He went for, through a train wreck for you. And we're going to look at some scriptures here where this train wreck was kind of taking place, just one snapshot of it. And it's, it's this time where these uh, spiritual leaders, these religious leaders, that uh, they didn't really like Jesus and what he was about. He was the Messiah, but they, he wasn't the picture of the, what they thought the Messiah would be. So they didn't care about him or like him. As a matter of fact, see, I still got sushi in my mouth and all that stuff. Anyway, as a matter of fact, is that they, would, uh, they, they hated him. They didn't like him. They tried to destroy him and everything else. And so they tried to get the, Ro the Roman governor, this guy named Pilate, to buy into it. So he would just say, let's crucify him, let's kill him. And so I want to pick up just where this starts and where this moves along so we can experience a train wreck that Jesus went through and understand how much grace and love that he has for you and for me. It says this in the book of Luke, chapter 23. It says, Pilate called together, that's the, the Roman governor at that time, Pilate. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, and said to them, you brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. You brought me Jesus as this person who was just causing all these problems. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. He's innocent. There is nothing there to find. This is what Pilate is saying. And so uh, what do these religious leaders do? They try to work something around that. And what they have each year at the annual Passover feast it was their custom that they would allow one prisoner, they would set them free. And so now they thought, well, hey, we can go ahead and take this angle, and we'll go ahead and set a prisoner free. And one that they began to talk about and setting free was this guy named Barabbas. And it says this about Barabbas in the Bible, that he was a notorious criminal. He was notorious. He, he was a murderer. He, he caused re, uh, rebellions to happen in cities. He was a thief. All of these things, it would be like saying, you know, uh, let's go ahead. We, we can let someone go and maybe we can get Jesus on the hook. Let's get Charles Manson. Let's go, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead. We can, we can afford to just let that loose. Let's just get rid of him. Let, but we can get Jesus. And then we see what begins to take place next. It says this in, lower down in uh, Luke 23. It says, with one voice, they cried out, away with this man. Jesus, they're talking about, away with this man. Release Barabbas to us. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again. He's trying to get this, these religious leaders to think twice and say, hey, look, this guy really hasn't done anything wrong, but they're not stopping there. But they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. For the third time, he spoke to them. This is Pilate again. Why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then release it. I'll just go ahead and do something to him to please you guys, and then I'm going to let him go. I don't see anything wrong. <clears throat> but with loud shouts, they insistently demanded. Everyone say demanded. Come on, say demanded. Stick with me. They insistently demanded that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. He gave in to peer pressure. Their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will to do exactly what they wanted. And so they get this Jesus, or this, this Barabbas, and they, they get to a place to where they can actually exchange him. And I want you to see this, and maybe you haven't seen this before, but this exchange between Barabbas and Jesus is a snapshot of what the crucifixion and the resurrection is all about. 
You have this man who deserved the death penalty, who deserved to be locked up in prison, who deserved to, have, to be sentenced and, and to be convicted. You have that. And then you have Jesus here who they are exchanging right in front of everybody. Everybody. People don't even see it. They're mad and they're angry and upset. But there's this holy chaos that is going on. The exchange in this, this, this beautiful picture of what God is doing right there before their eyes. And then it begins to move forward even further. And we learn this in this time. And this is, it, it worked in that story and it worked now even for us. And it makes sense to us because of what Jesus did. Is that Jesus took your place so that you could know grace. Jesus took your place so you could know grace. Not that you could just know about grace. Not that you would be able to spell grace or have the definition for grace. No, that you would actually know what it means to have grace. This grace that releases you from all the responsibilities of everything you've done wrong. Jesus gave, gives us that freedom by releasing the responsibility. Everything you did wrong, everything in the past, if you piled it all up, that God would just say, it's, it's all gone. You, you don't have any responsibility for that anymore. Jesus has taken it. And then not only that, to take it a step further... To now, where, where because of Jesus, not only have we take, had this taken from us, now we get to live a life of blessing and reward. It would be enough to take this away, but now saying, now God's saying, I've got this grace, so I want to bless your life. I want to do more with your life. I want to give you eternity. I want to give you purpose. I want to give you hope. And this is what we have in God in this exchange between Barabbas and Jesus and this holy chaos. And so we don't need to be afraid of chaos because there's some kind of exchange happening even when we don't see it. Because Jesus took your place. He took my place and all the things we did wrong so that we could know God's grace. I think about the exchange and I think about taking on someone else's uh, you know, consequences and, and I think about uh, kids. You know, as kids are growing older and they're in different stages, there's different levels of discipline. You know, when they're really tiny, little baby, you kind of shake your finger at them and tap them on the butt. No, no, no. You know, you just say something like that, and then they get a little older. And so now you start putting them on time out. So you start putting them on time out. Some of you just jump right to knockout, and that's not cool. So, uh, but we, we need to make sure we keep it to time out. And so we put them on time out, and then they get a little older, and we take some things away. And then they get a little older, and we put them on restriction, and we ground them. To where they're not allowed to go out with their friends and hang out and watch TV. We have, we've grounded them. We've taken that away. And then, now, Lord, have mercy. It is from heaven. We have these phones. And, man, you want to talk about a gift from heaven to be able to discipline your kids now. Come on, somebody. Come on, I'm preaching right now. Some of you parents, you have kids with phones. And it's like, if you take away their phone, the world is over. Like life, there's no reason to live anymore if they don't have their phone. And so it's good leverage that you have. But could you imagine this? You got a son or a daughter. Or we have a son and a daughter. Can you imagine this? Us punishing one of our kids and saying, give me your phone. You lost it for three weeks. And can you imagine the other one over here saying, you know what? Here, mom, I, I want you to just take my phone and, and give, give his phone back. I want him to be able to have his phone the whole time. I'll lose my phone for three weeks, and I won't be able to do anything because I, I just care about him. First off, you'd be floored. You'd probably pee your pants because you couldn't figure something like that out. That is, that is like unheard of. But to, to take that place and be the substitute and say, here, have my phone, have have all the freedom I have. You, you can go on Instagram while I won't. You can, you can be on Snapchat. You can text all your friends or whatever while I sit in silence for three weeks. Here, I'll even give you some Apple Pay to, to go and buy some things you want on Amazon or whatever. That, that's kind of like a picture of what Jesus did. I'm taking all of this away and I'm giving it all to you. And I'm taking the penalty that you had. And that's what's happening with Barabbas and with Jesus here. And I want us to look at some things that we see in the scripture, in the story, this train wreck that is happening of what Jesus went through. And I want you to see this. Because of the things that Jesus went through, we have something greater to experience because of what he had to go through, this chaos, this holy chaos, what it produced in our lives just for us. If we have opened up our hearts to God. 
The first one that happened to Jesus, and it was totally terrible and miserable, and it is so wrong, but he was maliciously accused. He was maliciously accused. Everyone say maliciously. Maliciously. They hated him. They wanted to hurt him. They wanted him to suffer. They wanted him to pay the price, and they did not care how it was going to happen. They did not care how they could maneuver things, and they gave him accusations. And here is Jesus, full in a room full of adversaries, everybody who's against him, without anybody there to be an advocate, to be for him, to be with him. Jesus is alone. And not only that, they're screaming for Barabbas to be released. They want this criminal who is known for killing people. They want him to be released and get rid of the guy who actually gives life. And are you kidding me that you would actually want that? And here is Jesus just left by himself. You know, this speaks to the times where things are done to us and we can't figure it out. And we're just like, are you kidding me? This is really happening to me right now? Jesus wasn't defended. And Jesus was alone. Because Jesus was maliciously accused, because Jesus didn't get it, we learn this, that when life makes sense, when life doesn't make sense, God is still present. When life doesn't make sense, when it seems like, you know, again, it's chaotic, when things just aren't adding up and you feel like I'm trying to get things right, I'm trying to do things right, and when life doesn't make sense, I want you to know God hasn't gone anywhere. Some of you just feel right now in whatever case it may be, it may, may be individually, it may be personal, that you just feel like things aren't making sense and you thought God would have or you thought God should have or this person did this, I want you to know God hasn't left you today. God hasn't left you in where you are. He sees everything and he's with you through it all, even through the holy chaos. That's what makes it a holy chaos. Jesus took your place so that you could know God's grace. And not only was he maliciously accused, but he was wrongly convicted. He was wrongly convicted. Everyone say convicted. Come on, stay with me. Say convicted. Come on, say amen. Say preach Pastor Dave. All right, good, good. He was wrongly convicted. On that moment, in that sight, they turned Jesus into a convicted felon or more. They turned Jesus into a criminal right before everybody's eyes. They convicted him to go to the cross that he was going to have to pay, that he was getting the death sentence. That's what they did, and they were sending them there. And Jesus had to carry the guilt. And you know what happens is, is because Jesus carried the conviction, Jesus carried the guilt, we find forgiveness. Barnabas, or, um, Barabbas, Barabbas had every reason. He was rightly convicted for what he had done. He was thrown in prison for what he had done. It was right for that. And it was wrong for Jesus to have to go through that. Because Jesus did everything right. But I want you to know this. Because we're Barabbas. Is we've been wrong. We've been wrong. But Jesus was so right and took the conviction for us. That Jesus comes in. And he turns all of our wrongs, and he makes us right. And that's the power of a love that Jesus would give just for you and just for me, that he does that. He loves us that much. And then we're able to find this, is that simply when we feel there is no way out, God still sets us free. When there's no way out, God still sets us free. When you have made a pile of junk and when you have made all these things wrong and you know it, you've been the blame, you're the problem or whatever, God still says, I'll still forgive you and I'll still set you free. He was maliciously, maliciously accused and he was wrongfully convicted and he was innocently scourged. He was innocently scourged. Jesus, after being convicted to be on the cross, here's 
Pilate, he sends him off and gives into the crowd and, and he sends Jesus off to be scourged and to be beaten. And they would take these, these, uh, these whips that they would call the cat of nine tails with nine straps of, of leather and they'd put sharp rocks in them and they'd dip it in water so that when they would whip somebody, it would stick to their skin and they'd rip it off and they'd rip their flesh. They were being mutilated and it says this about Jesus, that he was like a lamb led to the slaughter. See, a lamb doesn't know when it's going to be slaughtered. It's willfully going. It can't be forced. It doesn't have to be forced. And Jesus was that sacrificial lamb. He did not refuse or try to force his, force his way away from it or get out of it at all. Jesus innocently took on the scourging for you and for me. And here are these people. They all want to see him die. They're waiting for the drops of blood, but they're not realizing this. The same drops of blood that they see is the same blood that's going to wash their sins away. The same blood that comes and it sets the captives free and it makes us right and holy and pure before God. The same blood that makes me brand new. They didn't see it. And, and when they took the whip and they saw his skin shredded, they didn't understand that by his stripes we're healed because the whole point of a scourging was to humiliate people and it was to wound them and because he went through the humiliation and he went through the wounds and he bled the blood what we find out is this is that there is healing to our soul there's healing for our body some of you are sick in body I want you to know there is healing because of what Jesus went through and he was innocent and he was scourged and we learn this that God trades healing for our pain. God trades it. He doesn't want you to have it. If you're in pain today, I want you to know God wants to make an exchange there. It's a holy chaos that God is beginning to make and do something new in your life. Because Jesus took your place so that you could know this kind of grace. And the last one, it's about the crucifixion, is that Jesus was unjustly crucified unjustly crucified. Barabbas had earned his place on the cross. Barabbas was the one that did everything that deserved to be there. What Barabbas had when he was sentenced to the cross, that was justice. He got just what he deserved because of what he did. And with Jesus, it was injustice. It was something that this holy man, this righteous man, this innocent man, even Pilate, who's in the Roman government, he just can't see anything wrong with Jesus at all. He sees the innocence of Jesus and who he is, and he is crucified, and it was an injustice. And we go through times, we go through challenges to where it is not right what's happening. This is not fair. This is not how it should be. And we fight with the problems. And one of the best things you can do maybe is that in those seasons that you just stand still and you still become faithful to the Lord and you still try to keep your composure in those moments and not allow the problems to overtake you. But understand this, that God's purposes are bigger than your problems. The purpose that God is going to work through, you may say, hey, I know that God's in the storm, but it's hard to like feel him and touch him and see him. I want you to know God's purpose in that storm, in that moment, is going to come in and it's going to change everything because God's purposes are bigger than your problems. Your problems are temporary. God's purposes are permanent and they are eternal and he wants to do something far greater in your life than allow you to just go through problems without getting something out of it. It's a holy chaos. Come on, somebody say amen come on say amen there's a holy chaos that is there and so here is Jesus he has gone through all of this he was unjustly crucified he was innocently scourged he was wrongly convicted he was maliciously accused and he never defended himself once he never tried to make his case Scriptures say he didn't even open his mouth. He didn't try to become stubborn or kind of start to freak out. He didn't say anything at all. And you know what? That drove Pilate nuts. It drove Pilate nuts because he couldn't imagine, he didn't know this, that Jesus was taking his place so that he could know grace. 
And it drove Pilate nuts. And he's just trying to get Jesus to say something and do nothing because he doesn't want to see Jesus crucified in his mind when he's innocent. And there's no reason at all. There's no purpose behind that. But Jesus knew. And here's an interaction when this is all taking place, this train wreck. Here's an interaction that happens between Pilate and Jesus. He's speaking to Jesus and he says, do you refuse to speak to me? Jesus, I'm trying to help you out. I'm trying to help you get out of this. Do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate said? Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Don't you know I can help you out and it's up to you if you give me something to work with, I can help you? Don't you see I have the power to free you or to crucify you? And Jesus answers this way. You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Pilate, you're in a holy chaos right now. The power that you have is only a power that comes from God. That I'm here today and I'm going through all of these issues, all of this chaos that you see that you want me to jump out of and you think I shouldn't be in. But I want you to know God's given you power. He's given them influence over you and your power because there is a holy chaos that is happening that all of humanity, because I'm here and what I'm about to go through and what you're about to see, that humanity is going to be healed, humanity is going to be set free, humanity is going to have new life, humanity is going to be changed because of what's happening and God gave you that power so this could happen to me. It's a holy chaos. You have holy chaos happening right here. And here's the interesting thing about Barabbas' name. Barabbas' name means son of the father because his dad was a rabbi and it was son of the father. He was a son of a man. But then Jesus comes along and Jesus means son of the father. But it's not talking about a man. It's talking about the son of the heavenly father. And here comes the son of the heavenly father and he swaps places so that we could know grace because he's taking our place. It was holy chaos, and it was all for you and for me. It was a train wreck that he went through. It was holy chaos when he was betrayed, and he was kissed in betrayal. It was holy chaos when he was maliciously accused. It was holy chaos when he was convicted of a crime that he never committed. It was holy chaos when they took him and they, they put him on the cross and he breathed his last breath and he said, it is finished. And before that, even in this holy chaotic moment that Jesus would look to God and say, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. They don't know what's going on in this chaotic moment. It was holy chaos. It was holy chaos when Jesus would die and it says that the thunder would roll, the earth shook and rocks split because it was a holy chaotic moment. There was holy chaos when Jesus was buried and put into a tomb. And then for three days, he lay there, he's dead. But you know, while there was all the while where people were mourning, it was holy chaos. Jesus went down into hell. He set captives free. He took the keys of, of the kingdom of hell to be able to set us free, to help us to be free and have this freedom that we know in, G, in God from this forgiveness of sins is holy chaos. It was holy chaos when he's in the tomb and all of a sudden he disappears. And these ladies who have known him and been with him, they go to the tomb and they ask, where is he at? And there's an angel that's there. It's a holy chaotic moment. And there's an angel that's there. He says, why do you come here? He is not dead, but he is risen. He is alive. There's a resurrection. You've seen Jesus go through the train wreck. You see him get buried, and he's down, and it looks like he's down for the count. But ladies, you have to know something. This is a holy, chaotic moment. There's something divine that is happening here. And because of that, you have freedom. You have eternity. You have new life. Because he took your place so that you could have grace and so you can know grace. Because of that grace, we're redeemed. We're bought back. Because of this grace, we're restored. We're brought right into a relationship with God. We're, we're reconciled. All the things that were wrong between us, Jesus, Jesus made those right. And because of Jesus, we're reunited with a God who loves us. And here's the thing about it. With this grace, with redemption, 
with reconciliation. And all of these things is all you have to do is respond. That you would respond and open your heart and say, you know what? I received the train wreck that Jesus went through for me to die on a cross, to give up his life so I could have salvation, that I could have healing, that I could have purpose, that I could have hope. I want a new life. And all you have to do is say yes to Jesus today. Say yes on Resurrection Sunday. He is not dead. My Savior is alive. And he is living inside of me. And he'll be living inside of you when you just open your heart to him. Let me pray for you today. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your power right now. That we're in a giant room, this room called planet Earth. We are together. We're here in one accord. Thank you, Jesus, for taking my place. For all of us, God, we have the spirit of Barabbas, God, that we, we don't deserve this. We shouldn't be there. But Jesus, because of your grace, we're reunited with God. Lord, I pray for those who maybe haven't ever prayed this prayer of salvation. That, Lord, they would open their hearts to you and say, I'm going to begin to trust you with my life, Lord. And I'm going to begin to follow you. Lord, thank you for this great day. This day of victory. This day of power. This day of knowing and learning that we have a God who was for us and not against us. We thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Now I want to make sure that you join us on the next several weeks because I'm going to be going through different characters in the Bible that they all have their holy chaos, but we see how God actually showed up and worked on their behalf. And in the same, in the same ways, there's all these different ways we're going to look at, but in the same significant parts that you and I go through, these people do too, we're going to see how maybe there's, there's a holy moment in the chaos that you're going through as well in the issues of your life, all right? We want to make sure that you come back. We want you to know Jesus. And, uh, you know, if, if you're on uh, social media right now and you just want to say, I said yes to Jesus somewhere in there, you want to say amen, whatever it is, we want you to celebrate with us the resurrection of Jesus, all right? So make sure you come back and check out the next few weeks here at Streamline Church. Wow, what a powerful service. If you're new, I wanted to give you some direction on how you can actually get that Chick-fil-A gift card. Be one of the first 20 people to enter in your information at www.streamlinechurch.com forward slash new or go to our app and at the very bottom it'll say new with a question mark. Click that. There's a form to enter in. Be sure to include your address because that's how you'll get the gift card from us. We just want to say thank you for choosing to join us, Streamline Church, for your Easter Sunday. Uh, we hope you guys all have a wonderful day and happy Easter. All right. Thanks again for joining us for Resurrection Sunday. Uh, we look forward to seeing some of you that are new, uh, actually able to come and join us when we meet in person. All right. Let me send you out with a blessing today to have a fantastic Easter, all right? Church, you are God's treasure possession. Your heavenly Father is proud of you, he watches over you, and he will take care of you. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you and he will help you. Because of Jesus Christ, you can be anything and you can do anything. You are the hands and feet of Jesus in a lost and dying world. You are a difference maker. Nothing can take away God's greatness in your life. Come on, help me out now in your living rooms. You got to help me. You got to say it with me. You are blessed. Amen. I love you guys. Have a great Easter.